thank you very much and, uh, and welcome. I'd like to begin the press conference by again thanking the governors and premiers for traveling to Vermont this week to attend the 42nd annual conference of the New England governors and Eastern Canadian premiers. For over four decades, our states and provinces have come together each year to strengthen our region through cooperation. Regardless of who is sitting, governor or premier, is whichever political party is in power or what international debate is unfolding, we come together to listen and talk about what we can do better as a region. We leave our borders, political parties, and differences behind when we attend the NEG ECP conference and enter the sacred tradition of fostering coalitions, building relationships, and promoting civility. As, uh, as our national leaders uh, debate trade and, and other issues on the international stage, it's really important that we stay committed to bipartisanship and have civil discussions in order to achieve prosperity for all of us in the New England and Eastern Canadian region. Now I'd like to turn it over and welcome my fellow governors uh, and premiers to say a word for a few words, uh, starting with our co-chair, uh, Premier Gallant of New Brunswick. Thank you very much, Governor Scott. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here and I enjoyed our conversations with my colleagues, but I certainly want to uh, to make it clear that all New Brunswickers are still thinking of the community of Fredericton, the Fredericton Police Force, and the families of the victims of the shooting that happened just a few days ago. Um, on behalf of all New Brunswickers, I want to thank my, my colleagues here at this table, uh, the governors, the premiers, and representatives for their thoughts and their condolences. Uh, we had a great meeting today. We discussed uh, how it is important for us to collaborate on many issues, whether it be on energy, climate change, and on the very important issue that is certainly top of mind uh, for us, uh, trade. Uh, we very much enjoyed the leadership of Governor Scott. Not only uh, did he do a great job in hosting us here, making sure we have productive conversations, uh, he also did a great job of demonstrating how we can work together to the benefit of the people we represent, and it's great to have a governor like him that is focused on making sure there are regional cooperation so we can grow the economy for the people of Vermont and that we can work together to improve the quality of life of all the people in New England and in the eastern Canadian provinces. Uh, with that said, uh, I'll say just a quick few words in uh, French if anybody wants to try to grab the translation. Uh, merci beaucoup, uh, au gouverneur Scott, pour uh, le, le beau travail qu'il a fait à guider nos discussions aujourd'hui. Nous avons eu une belle conversation concernant des sujets très importants pour les Canadiens, Canadiennes, Américains et Américaines. Uh, nous avons discuté entre autres du commerce international, du commerce spécifiquement entre nos deux pays. Et nous avons bien sûr discuté des, uh, des sujets très importants comme l'énergie et les changements climatiques et comment nous pouvons travailler ensemble pour combattre les changements climatiques et aussi sur des possibilités dans le secteur de l'énergie. Alors, encore une fois, je remercie le gouverneur pour son leadership et pour tous les organisateurs et organisatrices pour le beau travail qu'ils ont fait pour nous accueillir ici. Et on a bien hâte de tous vous accueillir en 2019 au nouveau Brunswick. Thank you. We'll now hear from Premier McLaughlin. Good afternoon. Uh, first, uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Governor Scott and his team and the mayor of Vermont for the hospitality over the past two days and for a fine substantive program around the themes of uh, energy, environment, and trade uh, to acknowledge uh, as the uh, jurisdiction that hosted the initial uh, conference in 1973 of the New England Governors and Eastern Canadian Premiers that this organization, this gathering, continues to be an important uh, annual and then between meetings occasion to build uh, substantive responses and collaboration among our 11 uh, jurisdictions and I believe it's more important and evident in our discussions today uh, that it's more important than ever uh, that there be effective regional and subnational uh, collaboration uh, on important issues that matter to uh, our citizens and to our uh, continued prosperity and indeed to respond to the issues, uh, important issues of environment and energy that we continue to deal with together. Thank you. Next we have Baker. 
Well, thank you very much, and I'll just echo the previous speaker's appreciation for the work and the hospitality that was demonstrated by Governor Scott and his team um, as part of this conference. And I would just say that uh, I've gone to four of these now, and uh, and I really appreciate and hosted one of them, and I really appreciate the quality of the dialogue between and among uh, both the governors and our colleagues to the north on so many issues that we share common interests in. Um, and whether you're talking about what we talked about today, which was storage and uh, electric vehicles and, and trade and, and a variety of other conversations, or you're talking about a whole bunch of other things that we've discussed over the past four years, um, I always learn something at these events. Uh, I always learn something that I can take back and share with my own team. Um, and I consider it to be uh, both a learning experience, but also a chance to continue to build on relationships that have served all of us very well for a very long period of time and serve the people that we seek to represent every day um, as well. So this for me is, is always a worthwhile endeavor and I'm, I'm pleased to have had a chance to participate and learn yet again. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Governor Scott Phil. Thanks, for you and your staff. It was wonderful hospitality and organization. Uh, je vais faire la suite de mes remarques en français, bien sûr. Uh, cette conférence est importante pour le Québec. Uh, on regroupe les premiers ministres de l'État du Canada, les gouverneurs de Nouvelle-Angleterre, qui ensemble, for, ensemble forment un groupe économique très fort et où dont la cohésion est essentielle, particulièrement en ces moments de tension sur le plan des échanges commerciaux. Rapidement, euh, trois, trois éléments de la réunion restent à mon esprit. D'abord, euh, les discussions sur l'énergie. Euh, l'énergie du Québec, l'énergie propre du Québec, l'hydroélectricité demeure cruciale non seulement euh, pour nous, mais pour tous nos voisins. Euh, et euh, on a augmenté, il faut le savoir, environ 35 de nos exportations d'électricité depuis 2014. Et un autre succès récent, bien sûr, avec euh, le Massachusetts. La transition énergétique et les véhicules électriques, euh, le Québec ayant adopté une loi zéro émission, on est le seul État d'Amérique du Nord à l'avoir fait avec euh, la Californie, euh, distribue ses bornes électriques de plus en plus rapidement. Et il faut dire que les corridors de recharge, euh, like the one we have with Vermont, this, uh, corridors of charging stations, c'est venu, venu de conférences comme celle-ci, euh, de réunions, de discussions, et euh, ça va s'étendre, je crois, avec d'autres États de nouvelle angleterre Et enfin, sur le libre-échange, je veux saluer la présence de Raymond Bachard avec nous, qui a participé au panel. Euh, je veux juste attirer l'attention euh, de mes compatriotes québécois sur deux éléments sur lesquels nous insistons tout le, tout le temps, toujours. D'abord, bien sûr, l'agriculture et une défense ferme euh, et sans compromis euh, de la gestion de l'offre euh, au Québec pour nos producteurs laitiers, ce qui a été encore le cas aujourd'hui. Et euh, l'exception culturelle qui, pour le Québec, prend une teinte euh, tout à fait particulière et essentielle. So, on these words, uh, thanks for this very successful conference. <coughs> We've again achieved a lot of things that will matter for citizens that we represent, and I look forward to our next conference. Merci. Now, Governor Malloy. Uh, it's great to be with all of you, and I want to thank uh, our uh, Governor Scott and uh, Galant. Um, I want to thank you for uh, the great work that you've done uh, in putting this meeting together. I have to say that you know, this is my eighth and final as a sitting governor. Uh, and I have always looked forward to this event as a celebration of how close we are, how much we agree on, uh, and how closely we can continue to work together, regardless of any political movement uh, present in any one of our countries at any given time. Uh, and today's discussion on energy, you know, uh, electric uh, vehicles and uh, NAFTA and trade, uh, as well as the uh, uh, work that we had done, uh, had. I should say our staffs have done prior to our getting here and on resolutions is very, very important uh, to celebrate this event on an ongoing basis and make sure uh, that uh, our little part of the world, um, uh, Eastern uh, provinces and, and New England uh, continue to work together and quite frankly lead uh, uh, internationally and uh, in our own home countries. Thank you. Thank you, now Premier Ball. Well, thank you and uh, Thank you to Governor Scott, and as been mentioned already by every uh, every speaker, we want to thank you for the work that you have done and your organizers on what has been, uh, my belief, to be a very successful round of meetings again this year. And to Premier Gallant, uh, a friend of mine, is someone that I get a chance to meet more often, but 
Certainly our thoughts and prayers are with you and the people of New Brunswick as you deal with the current situation. And next year we look forward to being in New Brunswick, in St. John, uh, with this event as you will host, as you've co-hosted this year, and next year you will host the event. 42 years is a long time. And this being the 42nd Conference of New England Governors and East Coast Premiers, I think really what it speaks to is the success that we should never take for granted because it's a relationship. I know this is my third one, and I see many familiar faces, and I look forward to coming back next year because it is a relationship that is important for all of us. And as the Governor Malloy just said, I think many people, no matter where you go, can get a lesson. They can be taught a lesson from the relationship that you see at this table, that regardless of political stripes, regardless of your state or your province, we find a way at this table to set an example in leadership that others could follow. It's been my third year, and I know I've had the opportunity in each of those years to find myself sitting at a table with, uh, with Governor Malloy. I know I will miss his, uh, his experience, and I wish him best, uh, all the best into the future. So if it's climate change, if it's the environment, it's, if it's about energy, if it's about important discussions on free trade, we come out of this stronger because we find, we find a way and we take the time to sit at meetings and network with people like you in this room and those of us, those of us at this table. So it is my privilege to be here representing the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, a province that has had a strong history and a strong partnership uh, with Americans, and we look forward to growing that and to growing those, uh, those partnerships and relationships, and should never take those relationships for granted. They're important to us, and they're important lessons, lessons and messages that we can send to others in the world. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Now we have Minister McClellan representing Nova Scotia. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first and foremost, to, to Phil and Brian, I want to say thanks uh, as well for your hospitality. Uh, Phil, in your home state, you did a remarkable job showcasing uh, all that uh, your, your home has to offer, so uh, we certainly appreciate that. And uh, for Brian, given the circumstances and the tough uh, emotions you've been dealing with on behalf of, of your citizens in New Brunswick, uh, it's, it's tremendous that you're here to share uh, your time with us. So. Uh, we appreciate having you here. Uh, for me, I'm very proud to be representing my home province of Nova Scotia and Premier Stephen McNeil. Uh, this is an opportunity uh, for me to, to share in, in uh, this particular conference and understand uh, how, we, how we move forward together and how the, the bones of that are, are actually structured. Um, I know that the Premier is a very strong advocate uh, of this group, this table, uh, and, and the partnerships that we have. Um, the Atlantic provinces, quite frankly, uh, and the New England states are stronger together. Uh, so what we've learned today around trade, energy, environmental issues, and many things we talked about that weren't part of the formal program, uh, is that uh, we have shared interests. Uh, we have, you think of energy and, and how uh, our shared uh, cooperation is important for, for our economic prosperity uh, and for the security of our citizens. And, and that's just one example of many. Um, we, we have challenges and opportunities that we deal with together. Uh, and although the, the, the negotiations at NAFTA, as an example, are, are nation to nation, uh, it's good to know that from a regional perspective, uh, we're on the same page. And I think that what this reaffirms, the, the, the NEG ECP uh, reaffirms that uh, the, the relationships are strong, uh, that the interests are common, and that uh, anything we do, we can move together collectively uh, with a shared voice, and, and that's critical. And I think that outside of the policy formation and the support we give each other as governments and, and, and states uh, and, and provinces, uh, it's about people, uh, and when you network and, and connect with people the way that uh, we do, both at the staff and, and the, uh, the representative level, uh, it's critical moving forward. So knowing that we're, we're cohesive, we're a unit, uh, is uh, important given particularly times now surrounding things like trade. So I'm happy to be here on behalf of the Premier in Nova Scotia, and I really appreciate uh, the last couple of days. So thanks. Now we have Commissioner Caswell representing New Hampshire. Thank you. And again, I'd like to echo uh, thank Governor Scott for his hospitality here uh, the last couple of days. Uh, it's been an honor for me to be here as part, you know, on, on behalf of Governor Sununu, uh, representing the state of New Hampshire and getting an opportunity for a series of very, very successful meetings and uh, opportunities for new and expanding relationships uh, in the face of what is a really a long history uh, that is literally burned into the landscape of our states and our provinces. 
I'm often reminded of the story that uh, in New Hampshire we say you can't get there from here, and that's because all the roads run north and south. And there's a good long reason for that that I think we've had an opportunity to demonstrate today about the relationship between my state and other New England states and our, our friends in, in the eastern, uh, eastern provinces. So thank you. All right, we'll now take questions from the press. We're asking you to line up behind one of these two microphones and please state your publication and your name before the question. Hi, Veronique Prince from uh, Radio Canada CBC. Sorry, Monsieur Couillard, mm -hmm. uh, je voudrais savoir uh, uh, est-ce que vous êtes parvenu uh, à un, un accord ou est-ce que vous avez eu des discussions à savoir ce que vous pourriez faire si finalement l'accord uh, de libre-échange, euh, l'ALENA n'est pas renouvelée. Y a-t-il d'autres options? En fait, l'essentiel des discussions montre que puis, puis, on n'a pas, personne n'a rencontré un gouverneur aux États-Unis qui n'est pas favorable à la reconduction de l'accord de libre-échange nord-américain. C'est tellement évident. 9 millions d'Américains ont besoin de cet accord du commerce libre pour euh, prospérer, avoir de bons emplois. Même chose de l'autre côté. Non, je pense que tout le monde est sur la direction d'un renouvellement, d'une modernisation nécessaire. Souvenez-vous que lorsque l'entente a été signée la première fois, il n'était pas question de commerce électronique, c'est un exemple parmi d'autres. Euh, mais il y a des éléments que j'ai indiqués tantôt pour lesquels le Québec en particulier tient beaucoup. Mais je pense que tout le monde aujourd'hui travaillait dans l'optique d'une réussite et d'un renouvellement de l'entente. Il y a votre plan B? Ben le, le meilleur plan, c'est de renouveler l'entente. On ne peut pas reculer, on ne peut pas faire reculer le continent. Ça a été un succès extraordinaire pour tout le monde, cette entente. Could you repeat that in English? Oh, we, we were working on a scenario of uh, a renewal of NAFTA, of course, not failure. Uh, failure is not an option to use a, a very famous uh, cliche. Uh, there are too many people that whose lifeline depend on this to, to let it go. We will never let it go. And uh, what's reassuring is that we still have to meet one governor, or an important uh, figure in different states, that, that does not support the renewal of, of uh, NAFTA, but it needs to be modernized, of course. At the, at the time it was signed for the first time, there was no such, such thing as e-commerce. That's one example among others. But we, we, were, we are working on a, on a success scenario, not on a failure scenario. Can I ask another question to yes. Governors uh, Baker and Scott, please? Uh, if you could both uh, answer the question. Um, I can answer in English. <laughs> yes, <laughs> of course, in English, it's okay. Uh, is Donald Trump putting a decades-long relationship with your neighbors at risk? I think Canada is probably, if not our largest trading partner, one of our two largest trading partners, and has been for a very long time. And um, and that covers a wide variety of industries. Uh, and there's also a big relationship that exists in research and in uh, biotechnology and pharmacy and a whole bunch of other spaces, and education as well. Um, I'm with um, my colleague to the to my left here, which is I do believe that. Uh, after 25 years, plus or minus, um, it probably does make sense to renew the relationship between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. And based on a lot of the conversations we had uh, with our colleagues, both from the U.S. and from Canada over the course of the past two days, um, I feel pretty positive that that renewal will, be, will in fact take place. But it's very important to us, yeah. Uh, yeah, NAFTA is very important to us. Uh, Canada is our largest trading partner. Uh, we don't just uh, sell, we don't just uh, visit uh, each other. We actually build things together, and that's really important. And we have a great relationship. It's a cultural tie as well with a, with a border that we share. Um, and having said that, uh, we believe uh, that uh, the calmer heads will prevail, uh, that we'll have an agreement. There's too many states that count on uh, uh, Canadian trade. Uh, NAFTA is important not just to us in the Northeast, uh, but across the country. I would say that the majority of states benefit from, from trade with Canada in particular. So this is too important to all of us. We need each other, and uh, I'm sure that we'll come to agreement. Phil, do you mind if I add to, to that and uh, thank uh, Governor Scott for continuing this year uh, a program that we commenced, uh, initiated last year in Prince Edward Island of a business-to-business -business, uh, platform uh, in parallel to our meetings and uh, that was taken up very well by businesses on both sides of uh, the border uh, last year and again this year I like to say first time an experiment, second time a tradition. So we now have a tradition and that's attached to these meetings, a very important one. 
and one that uh, demonstrates in the uh, enthusiasm of the uh, parties that took part, uh, that participated from all of our jurisdictions, uh, that we have, over a period of time, uh, built a uh, story of prosperity together, and that continues. Uh, I'm Ben David, WCAX. Uh, everyone here collectively said you're here coming out stronger and working together, but is there a way to measure that progress in the long term like after this meeting? And for anyone, Governor Scott? I can take a crack at that. Um, first of all, you just look at the traffic between, and I'm talking now about the commercial traffic between uh, Canada and Massachusetts. Um, it basically ticks up. And I don't mean just as a result of this. I mean, it's a relationship that's continued to grow, as Governor Scott said, in both directions. The other thing I would point out is um, we've been pursuing a series of initiatives to reduce our carbon footprint in Massachusetts and at the same time uh, ensure that our, uh, our residents have a competitively priced um, energy set of solutions for them and that our businesses do as well. And um, some of the earliest conversations associated with that uh, direction that we've been pursuing started at one of these meetings uh, in 2015. And um, we worked with our colleagues in our state legislature to develop a pretty comprehensive approach to a series of initiatives around this, um, put out competitive procurements on it, and, uh, and one of the winners of that particular procurement was in fact a bid that we got from um, Hydro-Quebec, and, uh, and it involves a pretty solid relationship with the state of Maine as well, and will help the region deal with a number of issues associated with climate change and environmental policy and energy policy and do so in a way that um, enhances our state and I would argue our region's economic competitiveness. So yeah, I do think there's real work that comes out of these. I can answer as well. I think it, it is measurable. Uh, when you have a million jobs in uh, New England uh, that are attributed to uh, this Canadian uh, trade, uh, so that can be measured. Uh, we do to keep track of, uh, of how much we sell. We keep track of, of how much uh, tourism we have into the state. Uh, and certainly, when you combine uh, New England and the eastern uh, Canadian provinces together, we're the 14th largest economy uh, in the world, uh, just behind South Korea, just ahead of Australia. So that makes us a powerhouse in some respects. Uh, so uh, it's measurable. Uh, I believe that we can build upon that, and it would become will become even uh, more prosperous as a result. If I just may add, I mean, I think that if we ever needed organizations like the NEGECP, it's now. I mean, we certainly hear rhetoric when it comes to trade uh, on both sides of our border, uh, and to have governors and premiers sitting at the same table talking about how robust trade between Canada and the U.S between New England and the Eastern Canadian provinces uh, is helping create jobs for uh, people on both sides of the border. It's helping workers, it's keeping costs lower for families, and it's helping our economies. I think that goes a long way. And obviously there's a, a track record of success when you look at the, the traffic, as uh, Governor Baker said, in terms of the, the economic ties between our two regions. Um, but when we have some of the rhetoric that's happening, I think it's all that much more important for organizations like this one to get together, uh, to stand side by side, or in this case, I suppose, sit side by side at this table uh, and talk about the benefits of trade between our two countries. And, um, uh, and I just want to sort of hint to the last question as well. Uh, I, I think it's important for, for us to say, for me to say anyways, that the protectionist policies and some of the unfair and unwarranted tariffs such as the tariffs on the uh, soft food lumber coming from New Brunswick is hurting workers, families, and the economies on both sides of the border. Now, modernizing NAFTA is uh, something that many uh, have made the point that it can be a good thing. Um, we had great panelists today that talked about uh, some of the challenges and maybe opportunities moving forward. Uh, but I think one thing is clear, everybody at this table recognizes how we are all benefiting and all of the citizens that we represent are benefiting from the fact that we have robust trade in our region. Uh, and not only when it comes to trade are we co collaborating and cooperating when it comes to climate change, when it comes to energy and many other important factors. Uh, so uh, I feel like these meetings are always productive, uh, but all that much more important uh, nowadays with some of the rhetoric that we're hearing.
Let me just uh, join in for one, one moment. I, I, <clears throat> I, I think it's important to note that, that real damage is being done um, with the tariffs that are currently in place, um, and I, did, I, I don't think we should dance around that. We had an American manufacturer meet with us today in uh, open session uh, and tell the plight of uh, the, the effects of the tariff on steel uh, on his business on an international basis. Um, and uh, making his business uh, substantially less competitive, uh, raising costs substantially. Um, and although I think there was an anticipation that this would go on for a little while, uh, it's going on longer than anyone might have reasonably uh, predicted uh, a dispute uh, between two good friends uh, would last. Um, and uh, so I, I, I think that, that it was a stark reminder, at least on the American side, um, uh, that uh, we are uh, we are tied together. Uh, our economies uh, uh, are, in, in many ways, interchangeable. Um, uh, uh, cars are built uh, on both sides, and, go, and parts go back and forth. The same thing is true in my own state uh, with respect to uh, uh, jet engines and, and, uh, and other aerospace equipment. We're, we're the third most concentrated uh, state in, 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 the, in the United States. And this is having a, a, a real impact. And, and the, the, the sooner it's over, um, um, the better for, for all of us, and uh, it is measurable. Um, it was measurable today. Uh, in fact, the telling of the story of having to buy alternative, again, or alternatively source um, um, steel from another country, and how much more expensive it's getting as a result of the dispute that, that we're having on our border. It makes no sense. This needs to be solved um, uh, rapidly, uh, and I don't know a governor who doesn't believe that. At least a governor that is close to the Canadian border, or for that matter, the Mexican border. Good afternoon. I'm Pat Bradley with WAMC Northeast Public Radio. Uh, this kind of flows in with what you were just uh, talking about with the NAFTA, and particularly with the tariffs. Um, have you been working, whether it's at this conference or outside of this conference, to try to come up with any strategies to work around the tariffs, whether it's the state and provincial governments or with businesses, to work around them? Or is there any way to do that? I think collectively uh, we've raised our voice, uh, and, and not just here. We've been doing this for some period of time. Uh, and if there's any movement, and, and the president has recent, recently indicated that perhaps there's movement with, with, with respect to Mexico, and that perhaps there's a deadline or a desire to get something done, I have to believe that that, that is in part um, America's governor stepping forward and saying that this is not making sense. You know, I um, when when you look at uh, the the uh, price of uh, certain commodities in the United States and, and the impact of manufacturing uh, that's playing out. Uh, or if you look at uh, what's happening in uh, uh, various parts of the agricultural industry, inclu including uh, products that we both make in our countries, uh, but are being uh, uh, impacted on an international price basis because of the fears. Uh, uh, this is important work, and I think we've done that. Uh, and I think every governor um, um, is, is pledged to do what they can, and I think every premier is pledged to do what they can to help resolve this issue, which I think is more about understanding um, uh, the uh, cross-border implications than anything else. But no, I'm not going to uh, sneak anything in. Maybe I'd like to add uh, something here. We now, we're now facing a situation where we're dealing with tariffs and counter-tariffs. It's, it's to nobody's advantage. Everybody's going to lose at the end. Everybody. Uh, and if the situation gets uh, prolonged, uh, what we are seeing now in, in our side, on our side of the border, is people talking about reorganizing supply lines, supply chains, east-west instead of north-south, which is not going to be good as well for both sides of the border. So that's another reason why we should aim for a rapid settlement uh, on, this, on these tariffs. Okay. Bonjour, Marie-Michel Sibuit, Devoir, Journal Mexico, Gentlemen, we heard today Prime Minister Trudeau and Premier Couillard reiterate their support for supply management. Um, I also heard a, a plea for Canada to start negotiating during one of the sessions. Where can Canada compromise, in your opinion? Well, maybe I could uh, start because this is one of my favorite subjects, as we all know. Uh, we have to recognize that both countries su support their agriculture in different ways, but they do support their agriculture. It's not going to change. 
Uh, one way that we used to do this is to uh, have the supply management system uh, for roughly 40% of Quebec's agriculture. Uh, the U.S. on the other side does it through farm bills, uh, subsidies of various kinds. So it's simply not true that uh, the uh, that U.S. agriculture is a free market situation. It's simply not true. Uh, both countries have a right and should have the capacity to orient their agriculture the way they want, uh, the way their citizens want it to be too. We, for us in Quebec, it's important to keep agriculture at the, at the size of the family. Make sure that the children can take over and continue the, the, the farm. It doesn't become huge industrial installations that remains at, at the human scale in communities. I think it's a valid choice. Some may not agree with it, but that's our choice. So we will continue to use supply management. And I will personally defend uh, supply management everywhere. Everywhere. It is extremely important for our, the lives of our uh, farming families. If I may follow on that. Um, Trade discussions are not uh, a solution to overproduction. Uh, and that's exactly what is the situation uh, in, um, in the United States and in other parts of the world when it comes to dairy. Uh, in uh, Canada, we have uh, supply management, which ensures that we consume what we produce. Uh, the actual facts are that the United States uh, sells about five and a half times as much dairy product into Canada as we export to the United States. So there's no trade imbalance, well there is a trade imbalance, but there's certainly not one that warrants the kind of uh, uh, solutions that some may think which would be uh, to challenge uh, the approach that we have uh, in Canada. Ultimately, uh, farmers have to make a living, uh, and that is a big challenge. Uh, farmers work hard, they make investments, uh, they are uh, innovative when it comes to their products, and we're proud of what our dairy farmers uh, in my province and in Canada do uh, in that regard in a way that's competitive internationally. Uh, but frankly, uh, to come to your question, where is the, uh, I might say, uh, area where we can achieve the most, I would say most uh, people familiar with the negotiations would say to keep working on the auto uh, aspect uh, in a trilateral way. Uh, that is where we can make some and continue to build some shared prosperity among our three countries. Um, I'll put it a different way. Um, what we're doing in agriculture um, uh, in these trade disputes is the rough equivalent of saying we're going to shoot our dog if you don't do what we want you to do. Um, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's tremendously dangerous. Um, um, I, and I will say on the dairy side, uh, I can assure you that American policy is not working for Connecticut dairies uh, today uh, and hasn't for a very long time. Uh, and quite frankly, my compliments to our Canadian counterparts for the protection of family farms. Good morning, Good morning Bonjour. I'm uh, Renee Wonderland from Channel 5 News out of Burlington, Vermont. Um, this might sound a bit repetitive, but gentlemen, regarding tariffs, if there is one takeaway that you will come from with this conference, what would you share with Prime Minister Trudeau or President Trump about the tariffs. What do you want these gentlemen to know from what you gentlemen have learned today? So my one takeaway would be that the Mexican, U.S., Canadian trading bloc as a participant on the global stage where there are many other issues that people would like to engage in a trade discussion about is far more influential and powerful together than it is apart. And um, and I would hope that people would recognize and understand that renewing the current agreement among these three players will make them all better among themselves, but also make them a much more significant and important player in global trade discussions. And I don't think that should be lost. I don't believe trade wars work. I think it leads to uh, isolation uh, amongst our, our countries. And, um, and, it, and especially the way it's being done right now, the retaliation on both sides, uh, obviously, uh, leads to, uh, to relationship damage. Uh, and that's nothing you can fix uh, in, in a matter of a, a couple of years. It, it takes a long time. Relationships are difficult. Uh, you can't just say you want to have a good relationship. You have to work at it. 
and we have to work at this one. So when someone has to lose in, in some negotiation, uh, then it leads to uh, it leads to a, a compromise of the relationship in general. So I, I don't believe this works. I'll just simply add, I, I think you stole my, my words there at the end, uh, really that they have an approach where it's a win, 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 uh, and that they're not looking for somebody to lose in this. And, and that's how we built it over the last few decades. That's why it's such a success. There, sure, are some opportunities for tweaks and some modernization, uh, but ultimately it has been a win, win, win. Uh, and I think having that attitude is crucial for us to continue the prosperity that we're creating together. Thank you, Missy. Spencer Conlin, the local ABC and Fox affiliate. Uh, we had some folks outside demonstrating who believe that the leaders of this region are not doing enough to curb climate change. I guess, uh, what are your thoughts on that belief and what is being done in this region, would you say? Let me take what a first. Like answer. I'll take a first cross. Yeah. Um, this group, the New England governors and Eastern Canadian premiers, was actually one of the first collectivities, uh, certainly one of the first uh, international collectivities uh, uh, in the world to make uh, commitments uh, on greenhouse gas reduction uh, going back to the year 2000. And we have had since uh, 2015 a uh, commitment to reduce our emissions by 35-45 percent of our, uh, 90, of our 1990 base by 2030. Now that is actually a severe commitment to the Paris Accord. Uh, and we, each time we get together and between times, uh, collaborate, uh, work for renewable solutions, work for a greater and efficient uh, integration of our uh, power production uh, usage and transmission. Uh, and I don't think you'll find very many places in the world where you have that kind of multi-jurisdictional cross-border uh, collaboration and where everyone, you know, for starters, is looking for a solution, and frankly, uh, I would say each of our jurisdictions uh, is uh, making real headway, and of course we realize there's more to do, and there's more that can be done together. Uh, I just simply say we're not doing enough, we're just doing more than anyone else. Very good, thank you. Giuseppe Valianti, the Canadian Press and Newswire. Um, this question is for uh, Governor Baker. Uh, today and yesterday, I've heard from um, your colleagues, some of them, and other people at the conference talk about uh, President Trump's uh, negotiation approach and his negotiation style, whether it's certain tweets or uh, his tone, the message that he's sending to Canada and their allies, but mostly the Canada because we're talking about NAFTA a bit. My question is, what do you what do you think of uh, President Trump's approach, his negotiation style, his approach to these negotiations? I guess what I would say is that um, a negotiation always has ups and downs along the way. I I very rarely have ever been involved in any negotiation on anything that meant anything that didn't have ups and downs, and at some point maybe even people walking away from the table and then finding a way back to it. Um, the ultimate measure of any negotiation is the end. And with respect to this one in particular, um, as I said earlier, um, 25 years of no uh, review and renewal was probably long enough, and it's my hope and my expectation that in the end, cooler heads are gonna prevail on this and that there will be uh, a positive uh, result and I say that because I think it works I think it works for all three countries to end up with a renewed agreement on this not just in terms of their relationships with each other but in terms of their larger relationships with the rest of the world and I think that's something that uh, the White House and uh, and this country certainly understands and gets and I certainly got that message from the conversation that we had with some of the folks from both sides who talked to us last night and um, just a follow-up, uh, Governor Baker, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you might be um, a little bit uh, apart from the other, um, from, from your colleagues at the table when the question was asked about tariffs. I kind of got the impression that people were against them, but you kind of seem to say, well, 
you know, if, if it comes to a better deal, then, 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 it, then it, they're, they're a good thing. Did you see yourself a little bit apart uh, from, your, from your, your colleagues? No, I think what I was, I was saying something more along the lines of what the Premier here was saying, which is that everybody has a variety of ways in which they support industries in their country. And, um, and that support can translate into a variety of strategies and approaches. And I think in the end, what people ought to see is whatever type of deal makes it possible for the players who are involved in it to be as successful as possible. Um, but let's face it, there are all sorts of things that countries do to promote uh, their own interests and their own industries, depending upon the circumstances, the size of the industry, the role it plays in their local economy or their global economy. And that's not, but by the way, that's been going on for several hundred thousand years, I think. I mean, that's not a new, uh, a new notion. Um, I think in this particular case, it's important that people recognize that we have a lot to gain globally by being smart about how we relate to each other. Hey, can I ask a Governor Malloy a question? Um, we just have time for maybe one more question, so I just want to allow John, and if we have another minute, John Gilman from Mount Public Radio. I just wanted to circle back to the question that our colleague from uh, the CDC asked, which is, has the president um, threatened a relationship that has benefited both our countries for generations, economically, um, in times of war and peace? Has he threatened that with his record? I'd say from our point of view, is make it more fragile. You know, we've been allies, we've been neighbors, we've fought wars together. Our kids recently were fighting against terrorism together. We didn't expect that type of relationship from our friend, ally, and neighbor. Now I make a difference between this and what I see here around the table. And when I go around the states and meet with my uh, colleague governors and mayors of our cities, it's always very positive. Uh, this is something that we should underline. That, you know, what comes out of the White House is not the whole of the United States of America. It's a great country. We admire America and Americans. But we've always been friends and neighbors and allies, and we, we really want it to be that way again. Or keep, stay that way, rather. Governor, I just, uh, just wanted to ask you, what do you think is the biggest obstacle to a successfully uh, renegotiated and after deal? It, you said there was only a minute left. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that um, um, there has to be a desire to get an agreement. Um, I, I, so I'll, I'll go back to, to, I'll answer both of these questions. You know, in the absence of strengthening a relationship, you are weakening a relationship. Uh, and of course our relationship has been weakened. And of course, uh, we should not speak to our counterparts as premiers uh, or the head of federal governments, uh, the way that the, those conversations have played themselves out by tweet. Uh, it makes no sense at all. Uh, it is, um, at best, childish, um, and, and it should stop. Um, and I think that um, the danger, uh, to answer your question, is that um, the things that have been said and the things that have been done um, uh, pose a, a real threat to a long-standing and important relationship. Uh, $730 billion of cross-border um, cooperation um, is too important uh, to allow personalities uh, or relatively small differences to divide us. Uh, and so I think we have to be serious about who we are, uh, what we are, what that relationship is, how important it is, um, uh, and make progress. And I couldn't agree more than that this really does need to be a win-win. So you ask what's the biggest problem, it, is that I don't think everyone believes in a win-win. Um, uh, and unfortunately, uh, I think that's on the American part. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.